Hey, welcome everybody. We are live. Let me get the camera adjusted. Episode 125 of Martinis with Scott, a show about winning momentum in life and in business. This is a rare, a rare Thursday afternoon, 4 p.m. Eastern, have a drink with you live show. Uh, and before I get into that, let's enjoy our cocktail. Uh, I'm drinking the Ferdy Distillery uh, gin today. Cheers. Good to see you. Those of you that have uh, joined the stream, feel free to say hello in the chat, ask some questions. Uh, normally, we pre-record uh, pre this show. I typically do that on a Wednesday, and it's much better quality because it's on an iPad rather than the uh, computer, which I have to record this on just because of our subscriber base. And so the quality is less, but the prep time and the, and the uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, the production time to get this show up for you is far, far, far less. And yesterday, I wasn't working. I was off with my young daughter. Her, it was her eighth birthday, and we went skiing. I had a dinner last night, and I did not shoot a show for you yesterday. That was, I sacrificed you, as I've talked about. I'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> I sacrificed you, and I chose uh, her, and uh, I'm happy about that choice. But the result is, get a show out here, have a drink with you. thought we'd just do this live and uh, see if we can knock it off. I want to talk for a minute uh, as I talk about sacrifice. I want to talk and just touch on briefly on scarcity uh, versus abundance. Cheers again, by the way. Scarcity versus abundance. And I threatened on the uh, live stream that I did for 15 minutes earlier today, um, I threatened to talk about this topic. I'm just going to touch on it a bit more. Um, and this whole... You have to live. You've always heard this. If you're if you're listening to, if you're listening to self help people, to business advice people, I think this originated with Stephen uh, Covey and his book, The Habits of Highly Effective People. Maybe it was Seven Habits. Don't hold me to that. I read it so long ago. Um, that you ha you have to not have a scarcity mindset. You need an abundant mindset uh, to live your life. And according to Stephen Covey and the people that repeat that mantra, you know, a scarcity mentality refers to people seeing life as a finite, as a finite pie. So if one ter person takes a big piece, that leaves less for everyone else, right? So it's the zero sum game. There's a finite pie. If you win, I lose. If I win, you lose. That's the scarcity mindset. Most people particularly in the corporate world, have been conditioned uh, to a scarcity mindset because there's scarce resources in terms of who's going to get that job. Well, there's only one job, so there is limitations on that. Um, um, manager board information, micromanagement of bounds, generally short-term thinking is the norm, so on and so forth. So he says that scarcity mindset is what keeps us, many of us from achieving our goals. Okay, whereas what we need to achieve our goals is an abundance mindset that refers to a paradigm. So this would be the opposite of a scarcity mindset, that the abundance mindset uh, is a paradigm where we think, well, there's plenty for everybody. There's plenty for everybody. I to get my share. It's a non-issue. Okay, so the key to this, my key takeaway is that the scarcity mentality is what keeps people from from achieving their goals. Is that true? Do you believe that that's true? I'm struggling with that personally. I know there's a million reasons that keep us from achieving our goals. Plenty of reasons. One of them, or a couple of them, which I think are, you know, a driver of a lot of failed, uh, failed outcomes, is fear and self-doubt, Right, fear and self doubt keep us from achieving our goals. Lots of other reasons. Maybe our goals were ridiculous to begin with, but fear and self doubt most certainly, most certainly keep us back from achieving our goals. How does that relate to scarcity? Well, scarcity implies competition, does it not? If there's a limited number of resources, you need to compete to get those resources. If there's only one promotion available, you need to compete with your coworkers who may also be up for that job. 
to get that job. So there's an element of competition um, in this idea of scarcity. And what does competition do? It begs the idea, it begs the thought, can I win? Can I win this competition? And once you ask yourself, can I win this competition? Will I get that job? Uh, will I get whatever, will I achieve this objective, this goal, whatever that may be? That leads to self-doubt and to fear because you're questioning yourself. Can I win? I think this idea that a scarcity mindset is is keeping you and uh, from obtaining your goals and holding you back, I think it's just ridiculous. I think it's complete crap. I think what it's doing, thinking about abundance is a tricky way to tell your brain, oh, don't worry about the competition. Everything's going to be fine. There's lots of resources for all of us. The truth of the matter is it's the competition. It's competing for the scarcity that you are afraid of, and it is your fear that is holding you back. That's the truth of the matter, in my opinion. Uh, and as you know, our martinis with Scott, as I have a couple of drinks with you, and enjoy our Thursday evening, afternoon. A little bit of this is a, is a discussion. It's a, it's a mind experiment. It's a thought process. And so I'm not saying I have this 100% right. I'm going to go down this path in my own thinking on abundance versus scarcity. scarcity. But I, I, just, I just think the scarcity thing is a red herring. Uh, because there's always in everything, I think in absolutely everything, there's an element of abundance and there's an element of scarcity. Some things have more scarcity than abundance and some things have more abundance than scarcity. Let's think about that for a minute. Let's look at let's look at markets. Let's look at stock markets. Are they abundant or are they scarce? And you you uh, you listeners that are old enough, do you remember the original Wall Street movie with uh, Michael Douglas? Michael Douglas? Yeah, Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas and Charlie Sheen. So the gecko character, what did he say about trading? He said it's a zero-sum game. I win, you lose. You win, I lose. It's a zero-sum game, the very definition of scarcity. We're not both winning. I win, you lose, right? Zero-sum game. That's trading within a market. Is there is there an idea within a market where there's abundance, where we all win? I win, you win, there's plenty for everybody. Sure, it's called investing. We all put our money into the same stock, right? We're not necessarily competing with each other. Maybe we are a little bit for the better price. And then we just sit there and hold it. And over 20 years, the markets go up, the value of the company goes up, and we all win. We all win. Nobody lost in that equation. If you held on to the stock, if you invested, there was abundance. We all won. Okay, so, so in markets, there's abundance. And there's also scarcity. Scarcity. If you're, I don't know why I, I'm calling that scarcity. That's a Freudian slip, perhaps. But <laughs> um, there's also scarcity, right? So if you're trading, there's a winner and a loser on that trade. Very often that that's true. It is a zero sum game. No value was created. No value was lost. It's just transferring one thing to another, and vice versa. Whereas there's abundance on the investing. Let's talk about something else. Negotiation. I always. Um, you always hear a negotiation. Well, we have to come to a win-win, right? We have to come to a win-win. Well, a win-win, by definition, is an abundant mindset, right? And we talk about we talk about win-wins and negotiation all the time. But I love the book by uh, Chris Voss. Sorry, I'm going to turn this notifications off on my computer here. There we go. That's better. By the way, I have a philosophical question for you, which may be relevant. Uh, during this live stream. It's not right now. You're going to think it's a little off base. But the question is this. If someone texts you, if they text you and they say, I have bought you a double chocolate croissant, a double chocolate croissant, but then no one delivers you a double chocolate croissant, have they really bought you one? Does this thing exist? There's a philosophical question that we can all think about. Uh, this, this issue has been going on for hours, and we'll just see. We'll see what happens during this episode whether this double chocolate croissant really exists. Negotiation, win-win. Uh, Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference. Um, I have not completed the entire book, but I've picked up some pieces from it so far uh, because I read. I don't read books front to back. I just pick out the things that I, I like. And he, right off the bat in that book, explains, this, this guy, by the way, was the, um, the FBI's lead negotiator for hostage um, hostage taking. 
negotiation with, negotiating with hostage takers for release. And he says, okay, you've got a scenario. You've got a, you've got a, uh, a, a bank robbery that goes bad and it turns into a hostage taking and the bad guy's got 20 hostages. All right. How do you split the difference? Right. What do you do? Say, okay, you keep 10 and I'll keep 10. Right. There's the never split the different concept. Sometimes you just need to win. Right. And there's a scarcity element to that negotiation. There's 20 hostages and I want them all and you can't have any. Whereas the win win, the abundance element of this negotiation is shaking the boxes I've talked about in the past, seeing what that hostage person, that hostage bad guy taker, bad guy really needs and you know, and trying to give them something uh, that's important to them in return for the hostages uh, and what he's giving them is empathy. Uh, At the end of the day, again, I haven't read the full book. Go look it up. Chris Foss never split the difference. But what he's giving them to a large degree is empathy. Uh, And the book is tactical uh, ways to create trust and uh, deliver empathy and understanding of what their position is. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it but you do have to give empathy. So even a negotiation, which we all think is an abundant mi- mindset, I think Chris Voss's idea of the 20 hostages, well, there's scarcity, right? There's a limited resource. There's a win-loss within that context of negotiation. And what about time? Here's another example. It's pretty hard to argue that there's abundance in time. There's a lot of scarcity in time. Now, you can be more efficient with your time. You can use time management uh, strategies right? You could try and get more done during the day. You can keep to-do lists. You could do prioritizations. There's still a scarcity of time. There's 24 hours in a day, no matter how efficient you are. And so there's three examples. We talked about markets. We talked about negotiation and we talked about time. And there's, there's an element of, of scarcity and abundance in each one of those things. Some of them have a lot more than the other, um, in, you know, a lot more abundance and scarcity, a lot more scarcity than abundance. And I think it's just important to know what that is and to use an abundant mindset as a tool to specifically to not be afraid of competition, but to know that when there is scarcity, scarcity means that there's sacrifice. It means there's competition, there's sacrifice, which leads into why I'm doing this live stream is because you have to choose. And when we talk about things like uh, work-life balance, um, you know, should I go skiing with my daughter? Um, should I, you know, do a live stream? Should I do a pre-recorded show and a live stream yesterday, which I missed for you? Should I spend the day working? Like, can I have it all? What's the formula? There is no formula for having everything. You cannot have everything. You don't have the resources. There is scarcity of resources. What you need is to choose. And the way to choose is to think about, okay, what am I going to sacrifice to get this? Always ask yourself that question. Yesterday, I sacrificed you because I didn't do my 15-minute midday touch base. Yesterday, I sacrificed you because I didn't pre-record this this episode for you. Um, I chose my daughter instead. And other days, would I like to spend 24-7 with my daughter and with my family playing and skiing and doing whatever? 100% 100% I would. I would love to do that. I sacrifice that. I sacrifice that for my work and for my job so the family can eat, so we have the lifestyle that we want to have. It's always a sacrifice. Don't pretend there's no sacrifice. That's not doing any good. Be wide open. Have your eyes open. Be alert. You're making a sacrifice, and if you understand that and admit that to yourself, you're going to make better decisions. Okay, let's talk about the next topic. The 10 rules, the 10 rules for a brand. And this is drawn from Jordan Peterson. I'm going to let you all freak out about that for a second and think that this is going to be a political discussion and that I'm going to be shadow banned and demonetized, all those sorts of things. This is not about politics. I don't listen to Jordan Peterson for politics. I know that a lot of you, a lot of you, when you listen to Jordan Peterson, what you're getting is kind of a right wing or more specifically an anti left wing an anti woke culture, anti cancel culture, um, you know, anti this, anti that type of person. I don't hear any of that. 
I hear I hear science. I hear a person that's looked through uh, who who studied in depth the science of of humanity, of biology, of psychology, um, of uh, whatever they call when they're studying. Uh, when they're doing animal studies on, you know, rats or gorillas or whatever they're doing, and draws and, and a person who draws conclusions for, you know, the rules for life, and he, he studies um, hu human stories, archetyp archetypical stories like, uh, uh, like from the bottle uh, from the from the Bible uh, movies, <coughs> movies that have stood the test of time, like Pinocchio. They all draw on a story. They all draw on the story of humanity and teach us lessons. That's what I hear when I listen to Jordan Peterson. I know that there's a bunch of you that hear other things, but let's let that go. Let's let that go because you can't argue. You can't argue that he's been a massive success on a worldwide scale. His personal brand has been a massive success. So his daughter, Michaela, published uh, in the National Post in Canada uh, the, 10 key, the 10 keys to success in building uh, his outrageous brand. And just let me let me give you some ideas of how much of a success this fellow is, in case you're not sure. So his first book, which I believe was about two years ago, has sold almost six million copies worldwide. That's a lot of books. Six million copies of the book. His new book, uh, Beyond Order, which was out March two, so two days ago, pre-sold over a hundred thousand copies. That's a lot of pre-sales in the book business. Uh, his podcast and his YouTube videos reach hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people with every episode. There's a hundred thousands, hundreds of thousands of views on each blog post and newsletter and social media post. His lectures, which are per predominantly filmed from uh, U of T, University of Toronto, his lectures on YouTube are followed by 3.8 million subscribers. That's just amazing. With another, with another 1.9 million on Instagram, 1.1 million on Facebook, 1.7 million on Twitter. The viewership is monetized through podcasts and YouTube advertising, uh, book sales, the sales of three digital products, uh, which have helped hundreds of thousands of people improve and reorganize their lives. Uh, and, and what Michaela says is that there's a complex mechanism behind the scenes that keeps the Jordan Peterson machine running to be this huge worldwide phenomenon, this huge worldwide success. And she gives an example of what that machine is. Filming video, audio, and digital media productions are a huge factor. They have an internal team handling this. Uh, for instance, the delivery of a single podcast episode requires over 150 components weekly. Um, all content goes through rigorous, rigorous uh, quality checks, and the role, destination, timing of each piece is planned carefully. Tour planning is done with our event agents, and work on book is uh, and work on the book is coordinated with over fifty publishers worldwide. The business management work, operations, legal, finance, taxes, business relationship, negotiation, etc. On top of that, we work on driving the business forward by developing new products. Um, <laughs> and I'll just skip to the end of that. The point of the story is, you know, he sold a ton of product. He's helped a bunch of people. Millions of people uh, follow this person in terms of branding, whether you like it or not, whether you're into the politics or not. Uh, and again, I don't hear any politics when I listen to him. I hear science and conclusions um, and, and the hu stories about humanity. But regardless of what you hear, you cannot deny that this fellow has been a massive, massive success. And Michaela published uh, for us their 10 rules as to how they built this incredible personal branding story. I like it. I like it because I think the rules apply. A lot of it is redundant with previous Martinis with Scott content, but the rules apply to you, building your business, building your brand, uh, being an entrepreneur, if that's what you're trying to accomplish, I think the rules are are great insight. So let's go through them. Uh, rule number one, say yes to everything. Say yes to everything until you're completely swamped with work and then you can start saying no. So say yes to everything until you can start saying no. 
And so when you're starting a new venture, um, I just see so often uh, young entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs, and they've built a business plan, which is really specific um, as opposed to just directional. Like I want to head over here. I want to head. This is sort of, this is my big shiny uh, lighthouse uh, off in the distance, which is a little hazy, but that's the direction I'm going. That's not what their business plan is. Their business plan is something really, really specific. Talks about their target market, right? You take your, your customer base, you break it down in the target market as specifically as you want. It could be geography, could be demographics like age uh, and sex. It could be um, it could be price point. All sorts of different things. You break down your target market, and then that's what you go after. And it's so specific. It's so specific that it just doesn't allow uh, the entrepreneur or the brand builder to to accommodate different ideas and different things and you know we've talked about this on the show before what are the odds what are the odds of your initial business plan being correct and the, the answer is zero is that mike tyson quote that we all love so much which i think was a der uh, derivation of uh, general Patton, maybe some american general uh, general Patton's quote but everybody mike tyson's uh, version was everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face right success in business is a hundred percent is a, particularly new businesses, is 100% execution. Everybody has a great idea. Everybody has a strategy. They don't execute. Why do people succeed giving content away for free? It's because no one executes on it, right? It's a frustration of all content providers. Um, uh, you give value. Hopefully, it helps some people, but people don't execute. I mean, that's, that's the end of the story. And so you need to be able to execute um, don't get too hung up, as this says, on on being selective, overly selective. Uh, just start doing things. Just start doing all things at the beginning of your brand, at the beginning of your business. Don't do them crappy. You need quality, which is one of the points that Michaela brings up later on. Um, but you need to you need to you need to have a general direction, and anything that generally sort of heads in that direction, uh, you need to say yes to. And when you get enough, think of it as a funnel. When you get enough opportunities coming at you, now you can start to be way more selective. But if faced with the idea of should I do this or nothing, right? Should I do these three things uh, or nothing else? You got to pick the three things. You got to pick the opportunity that is there, and and it will help you. First of all, you'll be doing something. Right, it creates momentum. This whole show is about winning momentum in life and in business. It's about doing something and heading in that general direction where you want to go. I love this rule: say yes to everything until you're completely swamped with work, and then you can start saying no. Rule number two: <clears throat> be aware. Be aware that there is a lot of work that doesn't pay at the beginning. That doesn't mean it won't pay off later. When you're early in your career, when you're early in starting your business as an entrepreneur, when you're early in building your brand, you need to give. You need to give value. You don't have the credibility. You need to give value, and it's not going to pay you what you think you're worth, okay? But that is an investment that you are making. <coughs> Excuse me. You need, to, you need to build a rhythm to build a brand. You need to start doing things even if they're not paying you. I recently took over the end of last November, I think, November 2020, into early December. I took over as president of a company in Colorado, a hemp process, uh, processor by the name of Globex Extraction. It was a, it was a, a new company. Well, it had been about a year, year and a half old. But that year, year and a half was spent with the initial build out of the manufacturing facilities. And, and when I took over as president um, and controlling the, uh, the, the majority of the shares of that company, uh, it was just entering into its first revenue, right? So it was just starting out on its first revenue. And I had a lot of, con and, and at a time in the US, well, globally, when the whole hemp market is just falling apart, there's no, there's no real market. Uh, we're in a global pandemic. 
uh, there's an oversupply. So the various product lines, like a tea-free distillate, a tea-compliant distillate, uh, the crude, the toll services that we offer, who the hell knows what's uh, what the real market price is for that stuff? Nobody has any money anyways. And so the conversation with my management team in Colorado has always been, you know, I'm turning down these deals because we're not getting enough money. I'm turning down these deals because they wanted, or this sale because they want to do a split. You know, you keep some product, we keep some product out of the processing services. There's not enough cash in it for us. And we had to have a long discussion uh, and come to a conclusion as to how exactly we were going to handle this. Because the fact of the matter is we, we have a bunch of end use product that is really good for which nobody wants to pay because there's oversupply, because they don't know us. And so what I said to these guys at Globex, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a big Christmas sale. You're in sale and we're going to take a loss uh, potentially or we're not going to make enough money on selling some of, some of our end use products that we have in inventory. But here's what will happen. We'll build brand. We're out in the marketplace. We're advertising. We're delivering a terrific product. We're going to learn about the flaws in our system and where we're not ready to be delivering product and dealing with that. For example, invoicing. We'll learn whether we know how to invoice and how that ties into our back end accounting system. We're going to learn about internal controls and reporting. We're going to learn about drop shipping and delivering. Uh, we're going to learn about a bunch of things that I can't even forecast what we're going to learn. And you know what the first thing we learned? So we, we discounted our price. We did a big sale and people bought from us. And the very first thing I learned is that our product is at a very high quality. I won't bore you with the scientific details, but when you open up the, the tub that it shipped in, it doesn't look like a beautiful um, yellowy, honeyish color uh, sloppy oil that you might want to take in an eye drop and pop in your mouth. It doesn't look like that at all. It looks dark and it looks crystallized and it, it's it's hardened on top. It's a nice color. It's almost, if it was in a glass bottle, it would be a completely clear fluid underneath because, you know, the process, um, uh, the quality of the product, the container that we ship it in um, encourages this uh I can't think of the scientific word, but picture picture a smoothie. So you made yourself a smoothie in your kitchen, and it's 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 awesome. It's it's you know you got a lot of blueberries and other things in there, so you got sort of a purpley blue color. And then what you do is you leave it on your counter by mistake, and you don't get around to drinking it for a couple hours. You come back. How does that smoothie look? It looks like water about three quarters of the way to the bottom, and the top is just like this really really dark kind of concentrated material well that's what was happening to our to our distillate and and a customer complaint so what did we learn we learned well then nobody at the shop kind of knew why that was happening so we dug into it we learned it's because of the quality um the uh, the chemistry of our particular product uh which is pretty high end right we learned that our packaging was insufficient we learned that the market didn't understand why this was happening and that we needed to change our packaging and all of this <clears throat> because we we got some product moving out the door and in the end i think we've helped our company we've started to build our brand you need to invest in yourself at the beginning of building a business of building a brand rule number two from the petersons is be aware that there's a lot of work that doesn't pay at the beginning and that doesn't mean it won't pay off later Make sure what you're selling or <clears throat> make sure of what you're selling or saying is honest. <clears throat> you know, in the personal branding world, like uh, Jordan Peterson is uh, separate from the man is a personal brand. I'm building the Scott Sinclair personal brand, or I'm attempting to. Maybe it, maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. But I'm putting a lot of time and money um, into building this brand, and uh, the idea there is to try and help people. <clears throat> um, and what they tell you in that space is you need to be authentic, right? You can't make it up. And if you, if you're active in social media, if you're on Instagram or on YouTube or anything, you start listening to a bunch of other people on life advice, on business advice, 98% of it is crap. 98% of it, the people, they haven't walked the walk. 
they haven't been successful in business. They've been successful successful at a personal brand. They've been successful at the life coaching, right? They've been a success at that, but they weren't a success, very many of them, at other things first, right? So that's a that's a big difference. And so what they tell you is, you know, the successful ones are authentic. I like the Gary Vaynerchuk. I like Gary V. There's a lot of stuff that he says that I disagree with, but here's a guy who's running a multi, you know, several hundred million dollar company as a media agency on the side. And then he's on different platforms thousands of times a day. It feels like, you know, giving advice <clears throat> about how to create your brand and build your business. That's authentic. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. You may think he's a bit of a jerk because he's from New Jersey and he talks like a bit of a jerk sometimes. Whatever. That's all for you to decide. But it's authentic and it's authenticity that builds the brand. That's what they all tell you. Well, in business, it's the same. But then you have to think, well, how do you how do you reconcile authenticity with this idea of fake it until you make it? We've all heard about fake it until you make it. And what does that mean? It means when you're younger, you just go out and you're freaked out about making money. You're not confident. And so you start pitching things that, <clears throat> that maybe you're not capable of delivering, right? You start pitching stuff that you're not capable of delivering. You start pitching your experience, which may not be entirely truthful or accurate. You start exaggerating your capabilities, exaggerating your experience. That's what fake it until you make it means. People take it way too far, right? They, um, I forget the name of that woman who I think will probably be going to jail, you know, but you start, you know, she started, uh, she was in medical devices. She started creating um, falsified tests to get customers in the door, right? But it's all this just slippery slope of crime. It's this slippery slope of, you know, am I just telling a white lie? Am I exaggerating a little bit? How is this going to work? Like, I need people, it's a chicken and egg. I need, I need people to buy into my credibility if they're going to sell something. And the reason that you go down this figure to make a path is because you have no patience, you have no creativity, <clears throat> and you haven't sought other ways to build your expertise like creating content. The best strategy 100% of the time is, is honesty and integrity. You know, I had this, I'm going to tell you a funny story. <clears throat> I had a really, really super successful career and then business life by anybody's by anybody's standard, right? There's always richer people in the world, right? But any objective standard, um, I've always done pretty well, okay? I've always done pretty well. And then it was maybe seven, 10 years ago, I was in Florida and I was golfing with the boys, as we say, we're on the golf trip. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of guys in that group, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call out any names, Junior. But um, <clears throat> a lot of people, maybe maybe their scorekeeping, uh, Richard, are, is not exactly what it ought to be. Maybe they fill out their cards before they even hit the golf course, right? Maybe they took 120 swing, swings but scored 82 for the round. And it's all fun. It's all fun. But I was going I've, – I've never done that because I want to know for my own so – I'm not a good golfer, by the way. I, I – I golf three, four times a year. I shoot under 100 uh, most of the time, not always. But, you know, I'll shoot in the 92 to 99 range typically. But I want to know what I score, so I try to count everything. Yeah, maybe I'll give myself a mulligan once around. Maybe I'll improve my lie every that, now and then like most duff golfers uh, do. But for some reason in that year, I decided just to be ruthless I did, in terms of honesty. I, I decided that I'm not going to change my lie. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take a mulligan, even though people want to. I'm not going to take a gimme on that putt. And yet, you know, I would have shot 95 and I started shooting 103, right? And then I got it down a little bit. But you know what happened? It changed my mindset about everything. I started doing that in life. I started doing that in business. And I was never, I've never, I've always believed in honesty, but I was never this ruthless about it. Nobody's that ruthless about it. Uh, <clears throat> and I started becoming ruthless about it. And, and I'll tell you what happened. My business life grew exponentially. I don't mean even 10 times. We'll talk about 10x these days. I'm talking 100x. I'm talking that, that you, just, you just immediately, 
you're a good, honest dude or gal beforehand. And then if you step up that game and you focus, you focus on honesty and integrity and you do that ruthlessly, you just develop a reputation for that. And, and trust is everything, right? Trust is everything in terms of persuasion. You want people to do something for you. You want to sell somebody on somebody on something. You need to first have their attention and second, their trust. Well, wow, that just, I, I'm telling you, it changed my life. It changed my career. Something to think about, something to think about the Peterson's rule number three, make sure what you're selling or saying is honest. Number four, do not forsake quality for quantity. I uh, mentioned Gary Vee earlier as I was talking about this. And his mantra, he's always pitching, <clears throat> you know, forget about the production quality. Forget about the product. Just get content out. You need to get uh, 80 pieces a day or whatever he's doing and advising you to do. Um, and the, the quality doesn't matter. But I think what people misunderstand when Gary says that is that he also at the same time says the, the creative is everything. The creative in the content that you're putting out, the quality of your message is everything. It's not the production. The reason he's okay with no production is because it's the authenticity, right? I'm doing a live stream on a terrible camera with terrible sound, and I don't really care, right? My other option was to record this, was to send it off to a team of people, pay them a bunch of money, give you a slick give you a slick presentation with some music and some graphics and some whiteboarding, but that's not authentic. What I'm doing right now, drinking my gin and having a drink with you and walking through this is authentic, but hopefully the quality is in the content. It's in the message. It's in the creative. Gary Vaynerchuk is not talking about succeeding with a shitty message. He's talking about, don't worry about the production, be authentic on the production get quantity out, but the quantity needs to have good creative. It needs to have good content going along with it. Uh, you need to know who your customers are. You need quality control, and you need to tell them the truth. You need to be authentic, and you need to have a real message that is relative, uh, relevant to them, right? And and don't, don't waver on that. Don't dilute your message corporately than a corporate brand or a personal brand. You can't dilute your message uh, for the sake of quantity. Peterson's rule number five, Michaela's rule number five, if you are an influencer, incorporate a business so that you can optimize your taxes and expenses. So on the surface, this is kind of silly advice because it's a jurisdictional issue, right? I mean, they're sitting in Toronto, Canada, and, um, you know, <clears throat> taxes are part of um, the taxes and expenses, like it, it's just the way that's treated for tax purposes is relevant, relevant to relative to the jurisdiction that you're in, wherever that may be on the globe. But I think the broader point here is really important. You know, I, I talk about make more money in your business by focusing first on your margin. Margin is the amount of money. If you sell a, a, a widget for $10, and you and it costs you seven dollars. Well, there's a three dollar margin. Okay, I want you to make that three dollars, four dollars. That's the first thing. If you want to make more money, I want you to worry about that first. Second, I want you to worry about your overhead. What is your overhead? Well, those are your fixed costs, the rent that you're paying, the number of people you have on board. Okay, the things that don't change. So the salaries, the things that don't change month to month. Those are your your fixed overheads. And lastly, worry about your growth, worry about your revenue. Because when you go back to these influencers, to the advice to entrepreneurs that you see on social media, YouTube, Instagram, Clubhouse, all uh, Facebook, all of these platforms, 99% of it is grow, growth. Grow your business, grow your business, grow your business. Okay, it's the wrong advice. The first thing you should do is look after your money. I was on a Clubhouse show with a... Uh, Dr. Someone whose name escapes me, she is from Los Angeles, had a good chat with her yesterday on a clubhouse as well. And she had uh, she had uh, about 20 people in her room I listened to the other day, they were all female, and the topic was take care of your bag. You talk about getting this bag of money is the what people talk about these days. Well, her angle was taking care of the bag that you have. Don't lose it, don't lose it to too much overhead, don't lose it to tax. 
uh, the Peterson's fifth advice is if you are an influencer, incorporate a business so that you can optimize your taxes and expenses. Number six, do not underestimate social media platforms. They're all different and all worth learning. So don't underestimate the different platforms. So if you're a, a, a influencer, you would know this to be true. You can't just do it on YouTube, which is what I've been doing for a year and a half. You need to look at Instagram, you need to look at Clubhouse, you need to look at TikTok and Facebook and all these different platforms. And you need to have, you need to understand how each one's work, each one works. You need to create content specific that's context contextual to that platform, right? And then what, you know, you need to do blog posts and send out newsletters. And then what you start find is they start feeding on each other and there's a lot of synergy there. It's true with entrepreneurs as well. If you're starting a business, if you're trying to build a brand uh, in a new business, you know, what vertical market should you approach? Should you approach them all at once? Should you approach just one and be really narrow? How do you find that balance? And, you know, you, we talked about scarcity and abundance before. Well, you have a scarce amount of resources. You have a limited number of resources. You can't do everything all at once. I was once, once, uh, once uh, working with a drone um, I don't want to say too much, maybe, um, but a pioneer in the in the um, unmanned vehicle, uh, so the the uh, UV, what do they call that? Anyways, in the drone space, and uh, it's the gin. <laughs> I was once um, so advising someone in the uh, UAV. That's the word I'm looking for um, in the in the drone space, and he was a pioneer in this. And like most tech people, uh, when you're really creating an industry as, a as opposed to a solution or a product within that industry, when you're when uh, when like most tech people are faced with that situation, they've got every vertical market under the sun available to them in their business plan. What do I mean by a vertical market? I mean an industry. So if you think about a drone, well, what could a drone be used for? Hey, it's really good in the energy sector because you can fly up. And you can look over, uh, you know, your 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 plant or your transmission station or whatever it is, your infrastructure related to the energy. It's really great in mining because you can monitor from the air your tailings pool. Um, your uh, tailings pools are a big one for me because I've had one break on me for before, and that's 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 no good. It's no good at all if you're in the mining business. Um, so you can you can you can fly over your infrastructure again in the mining sector. It's really great for telecommunications. If you're a, if you're a Verizon, you can fly up and instead of sending a man up to check the cell phone tower, you can fly the drone around. It's really great in agriculture. You can go and you can check over your crops and you can you know do whatever it is you need to do in agriculture. It's really great in real estate development. You can you can map out the the land and subdivision and overlay a map on top of it. It's really good in uh, delivery, in drop shipping like Amazon. It's really good in this. It's really good in that. Those are all vertical markets. How the hell, if you have no resources, will you attract, will you be able to, to win, right? Because you have to win. How are you going to win without any resources in every one of those vertical markets? What's the right answer? Is the answer to go after all of them and lose? Is the answer to limit yourself to just one and you happen to pick the wrong one? That's a very, very difficult um, thing to figure out when you're a new business. I think we could do a whole show on that. And as I'm talking, maybe we should do a whole show on that. But um, but I think the the important part here is that you just you need to not underestimate underestimate the the choices that are available to you. You need to explore them all as much as you can. You need to keep as many balls in the air as you possibly can. And you need to you need to see what's winning for you and double down on the positives and forget about the ones that aren't working. Uh, rule number six was do not underestimate social media platforms. They're all different and all worth learning. Number seven, do not underestimate marketing. Recognize that podcast advertising exists. So this is really, you know, <clears throat> you start a business, how do you market? How do you get your name out? And, um, you know, if you can afford to advertise, advertise. I'll tell you some stories about that um, uh, on another time because we're, we're running out of time on this one. But uh, 
you need to advertise. You get your name out. If you have no money, uh, the answer is content. If you're starting a business and and you don't want to fake it until you make it, um, you need to, you know, if you're in the red pen business, you need to get on a LinkedIn form and you need to join or start a red pen group, okay? And you need to write posts about red pens. You need to drive content. You don't have to call to action. You don't have to have a call to action like come to me and buy a red pen because I have the best red pens. Okay, you just need to talk about red pens and that's how you start building a brand. You need to get on Instagram and you need to have a red pen uh, picture theme on Instagram. That is how you start uh, building your credibility and start uh, marketing without any money. I remember, uh, you know, years ago when I was back in university, I had started the Entrepreneurs Club. Uh, mostly because someone gave me a small check to do that. So I started an entrepreneurs club and we had in a speaker and we had several hundred students there. I don't remember much about this guy other than two things. One, I thought he, he was a, a real jerk. Um, but I remember a saying he had, which had always stuck with me, which was early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. Early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. He's absolutely right on that one. Um, particularly the advertising part. Don't underestimate your marketing. Rule number 10, connect, uh, sorry, eight, connect and learn from other people around you. Uh, do free cross promotions. Um, anybody that can can you help you with your growth. You know, in starting businesses of which I've done many, the, um, and, and I've done, I've, I've built businesses in financial services, money management, um, energy, uh, mining, hemp, cannabis, manufacturing, uh, biotech. I'm just looking through my list here because I was going to talk later about build versus buy, which we're clearly not going to have enough time to get to. But I built businesses and I bought businesses, but I built businesses in many, many, many different industries. Uh, but one of my favorite stories or one of the favorite things that I always try to do is what I call wholesale selling. I don't know if that's the right answer, but instead of going to, instead of me trying to sell you this red pen, um, I sell and focus on a, on a wholesale um, solution to red pens. So I sell to somebody else who's already delivering a bunch of pens to you and I partner with them and, and try to get my red pens into their, into their distribution of writing instruments in general. When I started uh, Merchant Capital in 1994 in Ottawa, so Merchant Capital was a co what we would call in the industry a corporate finance house. So we're an advisor two businesses who were trying to raise money or sell their business. And I moved to Ottawa. I didn't know very many people. I knew a few people really well. Um, but I met this guy uh, by the name of Brian Doyle, who was the managing partner. Well, he ran the, the FAS group, uh, Financial Advisory Services for KPMG, which is a huge accounting firm. And he had just been given the corporate finance mandate uh, he was the dominant insolvency practitioner in town in this accounting firm and just been given the corporate finance mandate. And one day he just called me out of the blue and he said, hey, I'm Brian, you're Scott, you're alumni, you came out of KPMG, you came out of the corporate finance group of KPMG in Toronto, you moved to Ottawa, I, Brian, have this mandate and I don't know what it means and none of my staff knows what it means, let's do something together. And what we did together, after we talked about it, is that we entered into a strategic partnership where Merchant Capital, my little, just me, just me hanging up a little shingle uh, for a business, um, met every Tuesday morning with the entire partnership group of KPMG, one of the world's largest accounting firms, partnership for the Ottawa area where I was. And, and um, Brian forced that meeting and we talked about the corporate finance opportunities within their client base and all of them went through me, every one of them. They all came through Merchant Capital. They were on a Merchant Capital engagement letter, but I used KPMG staff and I trained them as to how to do that. And to me, that's a strategic partnership. It's, uh, I just called it wholesale selling. And I got into every major tech deal in that city in those days, things that I would never, I would never have had the opportunity just as a solo practitioner with my shingle out to get into those significant deals. 
Okay. And so that was me partnering with somebody else. I did it again uh, after I took a couple of years off when I turned 40 and I thought, well, I'm going to get back into the business. How did I get back into the business? I did the exact same thing for BDO, uh, another large accounting firm. They were launching their Canadian uh, M&A uh, corporate finance practice. I did it. I did it under the range. My company is now Sinclair Range, but at the time I did it under the range banner and the engagement letters were ranges engagement letters, but I trained them with BDO staff and the, the BDO m and corporate finance group in Toronto uh, was launched with my assistants uh, and I think the partner at the time, his name is Clark McEwen, but launched uh, with my assistants and so was Range. So is Sinclair Range today. It was from that partnership. Okay. So the rule number eight is connect and learn from other people around you. Uh, free cross promotions with people who can help you, etc. Number nine, work with people who have the same goal as you and who learn tasks quickly. To me, you want to apply this to your business brand, uh, to an entrepreneurial situation. This is about hiring and firing. This is about having, having that shiny lighthouse on the hill in the distance. may not be exact, but you know you're all moving in that direction. Can you, can you verbalize that? Can you say it out loud? in a way that other people will understand. Can you sell that direction? And then can you hire people that want to help you move in that direction? And if they don't, can you fire them? Can you fire them today and get somebody else that wants to help you move in that direction? Uh, number nine, work with people who have the same goal uh, and learn quickly. And lastly, number 10, be open to being wrong. She says, truthfully, when it all started, we had no idea what we were getting into. No one in the family could have uh, imagined the scale and the opportunity that would come from this. Like it, again, this is the Mike Tyson thing. Everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. I love that saying. Um, your plan, your strategy, by definition, is not going to work. It's not going to work. You're going to try something. And if you can't admit that you're wrong, an A-B test. The whole idea of A-B testing is, I'm going to try this. Oh, it didn't work. I'm going to try that. Oh, that worked a little bit better. Then you try that, and then you go, let's try option C and see if it works. Oh, no, it wasn't a good B. Option D, oh, look at that was way better. It's not a matter of being right or wrong. You just, you just have to try new things. You always have to try new things, and you have to evolve, or you're not going to be successful. Your brand will not build, and your, and your business will not build. Uh, don't be afraid of being wrong. You are wrong. You're wrong. I'm wrong about everything every day. Um, there's always a better way. Don't get hung up on that. Get hung up on trying to find that better way. I had a bunch more topics I'm not going to get to today. This was me winging it with some gin on a Martinis with Scott live stream. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please, please give us a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up. Uh, hit the subscribe button. And uh, what else can I say? I think that's it for this week. Cheers.